welcome to another episode of our apologetic series dealing with the Muslim arguments that they typically raise uh, to support uh, the message of Islam, whether to support the Quran, uh, support uh, Muhammad, claim about miracles, claim that the Quran is complete and preserved, and so on and so forth. But today, uh, we're going to talk about a very unique argument that uh, for some reason, our Muslim friends uh, just make this assumption that this is the top argument to support that the Quran is divine and inspired by God. And that's the scientific miracles that are found in the Quran. With me here in the studio, our dear brother, Dr. David Wood, who's been really doing an excellent job with us here to try to dissect those arguments and going through the series. And technically speaking, what we have done so far has to do just maybe with introductory information. Lord willing, in the future, we will take it even deeper and we will take each one of those arguments and uh, basically provide uh, more uh, ways and tools to try to respond to it, especially this particular one that we'll be doing today that has to do with the scientific evidence of the Quran. Dr. Wood, welcome back. Thank you. And uh, the, the, this argument, the argument from scientific accuracy, is actually the, the first argument I ever encountered with uh, a Muslim back in the day. Um, back when I was in shape, um, I, I would go to lift weights and so on, and uh, I had a Muslim friend. This is even before Nabil. Um, I had a Muslim friend, uh, and we, would, we, would, we were weightlifting partners. We would, we would spot each other and so on. And one day he told me that he wanted to show me a video. And the video was about the um, the scientific miracles in the Quran. The guy was a Muslim. And I was watching the video, and I'm watching the video, and it, and it would, over and over again, it would uh, give a bunch of scientific facts about some topic, and then it would give some verse of the Quran. Right. That said almost nothing remotely resembling the topic, right? Right. It, it, would, just, it would just mention, uh, you know, a cow producing milk or something like this. And then, you know, but you were, you were supposed to be so dazzled by all of the scientific information that when the Quran says almost says next to nothing that any seventh century Arab couldn't have told you, um, then we were just supposed to be overwhelmed by this and convert to Islam. So that was my first encounter with it. And then later, of course, uh, my friend Nabil argued that Muhammad made all kinds of miraculous scientific uh, claims that weren't verified until centuries later, and that the Quran also made various uh, scientific claims and um, that were eventually verified. And what's amazing about this is Muslims very rarely actually read the passages that they're talking about, right? Correct. Most Muslims take things based on confidence in their leaders. So they think that their scholars and their apologists and are telling them the truth. Yeah, they, they believe that their, uh, their leaders are telling them the truth. So they've never seen the actual evidence. They've never seen these actual scientific proofs. But they believe other people have, and they have confidence in these other people. That's correct. And uh, so it, what? now I'm very different. As soon as someone tells me something, I, I want to look it up. Right? So this is, uh, this is very different because people actually convert to Islam based on hearing that the Quran contains all these scientific miracles, right? There are people who convert Absolutely. to Islam. Absolutely. Really? It contains all these scientific miracles? Yeah. yeah. The Quran contains all these scientific miracles. Muhammad said all these amazing scientific things. Well, I want to convert to this religion. Never crosses their minds. Let me see it in the books. I want to read it for myself. And that's that's exactly that's exactly what I would say to Nabil after he would say, this is predicted in, in the Hadith by Muhammad. This is predicted in the Quran. I would say, okay, you know, show me where, because I want to read the passage and see what it says. And when you do that, you start finding that all of these amazing scientific claims, um, there's nothing amazing about them. And you find that Muhammad got almost everything wrong that he could possibly get wrong. The, the only things that Muhammad got right were things that all kinds of people in the 7th century would have gotten right. So there is a sun, there is a moon, things like that. Muhammad got those right. There are stars, things like that. He gets those right. But anyone, any, any seven-year-old could have told you that. Um, when you start looking at actual claims that Muhammad made that we can test scientifically, he gets everything wrong. Whenever he goes beyond what any normal person would have been able to tell you, he gets it wrong. So let's look at some examples. And, and since I've heard both, I've heard arguments based on the Hadiths and arguments based on the Quran, we'll look at, uh, we'll look at some, some examples from both. So Sahih al-Bukhari, 
Number 3320. Muhammad said, the Prophet said, if a housefly falls in the drink of any one of you, he should dip it in the drink, for one of its wings has a disease and the other has the cure for the disease. Now, is that correct? There are Muslims today who will argue that that is actually correct, and they'll, they'll, they'll argue that there's some sort of scientific evidence. And, and when, when, when I brought this up with Nabil, he, 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 he argued that, well, if, if an insect is some sort of carrier of a disease and it's still alive, it must have a resistance, and therefore, but that's not what this is saying, right? That's this right. is saying right. that one wing has the disease. So It's specific. Uh, yeah, typhoid, something like that, something that makes you sick. Um, salmonella, something along those lines, something that's because flies eat some very nasty stuff and they pick up the diseases of whatever they're going for. They get the, the bacteria on their legs as they're crawling around on it and then they go and land in your food and they just got those bacteria in your food. Now lots of times your, your body can handle it. Your body has a has very good immune system, but sometimes you get sick. That's why people try as hard as they can to keep flies out of kitchens and so on, restaurants, things like that. Um, but so Muhammad's claim is that one wing of the fly has the disease, so typhoid again, something like that, and the other wing has the cure. Well, guess what? We can test that in a heartbeat, right? We can test. Okay, let's let's get a fly. Uh, let's check this. One wing should have the disease. The other wing should have the cure. Uh, or even if you want to interpret it, give them a little leeway in interpretation. Some part of it has to have the disease, and another part, the cure. Correct. And so if a fly lands in your food or your drink, you shouldn't like get it out and dump your drink out. You actually put the fly in there more, dunk it all in your food, That's right. because then you can get that cure off it. And Nabil told me he actually did this because his grandma told him to do that. He said, if a fly got in your mouth, I would dunk the fly in the food, so I got all that cure. And so is this correct? No, it's not correct. And any attempts to justify this uh, are absolutely ridiculous. No one, no one who deals with uh, no, no, no healthcare professional would tell you, yes, dunk flies in your food so you can get all the cure for the diseases that they carry. I mean, following this, the cures for all kinds of diseases, any disease that flies carry. You mean doctors it, who deal with infectious diseases, yep. uh, they're not going to agree with this? No, no, no one, no one in anywhere in the healthcare profession who's actually gone to any sort of school, right? Doctors, nurses, anyone uh, would say this, who is not already trying to defend Muhammad's, uh, Muhammad's views. So notice, Muhammad said something about science that we could test years later, centuries later, we can test it. That's right. And it turns out to be false. And if you follow Muhammad's advice here, you will get very, very sick eventually. Quite frankly, we don't even need to finish the episode because we've already proved that he's false. That's it. <laughs> um, but we have plenty more. So let, let's, let's go through some more. Sahil Bukhari, 3326. The prophet said... Allah has create Allah created Adam and his height was 60 cubits. 60 cubits is 90 feet. People have been decreasing in stature since Adam's creation. So I say that here's something we can test because if Adam was 90 feet tall, and maybe you say, well, it's, it's no problems if we don't find Adam's bones or something like that, you know. Right. Um, but he also says that people have been shrinking since then. So Adam was 90 feet. And then, you know, his children would have been a little bit shorter and right. their children a little bit shorter and their right. children a little bit shorter and their children a little bit shorter and so on. And so they're, 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 they're getting progressively smaller. Well, this means that somewhere we should find, you know, femur bones that are 15 feet long, right? At least to prove somewhere, this theory. Yeah. Somewhere, somewhere, right? Because some, sometimes bones do, do make it, right? We do find, we do find the bones. That's correct. Um, we never, we, we never find that. So if Muhammad is correct, people have been shrinking since the time of Adam, which means as you go back through time, they should get bigger and bigger and bigger. That's right? correct. When we dig up people from 2,000 years ago, 3,000 years ago, they should be bigger. Correct. And it's just not, and matter, matter of fact, they should be significantly bigger, right? Because you, you're going all the way up to, you know, 90 feet by the time you get back to Adam. And so here's another claim that Muhammad made that we can eventually test through archaeology and so on. And we just find out that it's the science does not support him. And also, scientists sometimes discover the so-called Homo sapiens, and uh, we know for a fact that their height, if indeed you know it's uh, they're hundred thousand years old or more, it's still does normal height. Does not confirm this. Exactly. No scientist in the world is going to say yes. Uh, Adam was ninety feet. The first man was ninety feet tall. 
Exactly. Um, there are other problems like blood circulating and stuff and, and something that tall and so on doesn't work at all as a, as a, as a living thing. Um, Sunan Abu Daud, 67. And this one's pretty gross. Sunan Abu Daud, 67. I heard that the people asked the Prophet of Allah, water is brought to you, water is brought for you from the well of Buddha. It is a well in which dead dogs, menstrual cloths, and excrement of people are thrown. The Messenger of Allah replied, Verily, water is pure and is not defiled by anything. Hey, Muhammad, we're, we're bringing you some water for... <laughs> to drink. For, for whatever. I don't, I don't know. They yeah. could have been using it for ablutions or something like that. Yeah. Yeah. But that, that's fine. Stick with that, right? That's the best interpretation. Okay. They're using it just for ablutions. They're not, they're not drinking this water that has dead animals floating in it, used menstrual cloths, and human waste, right? This is their toilet. This is where they dump their toilet bowls. That's right. And Muhammad, you want us bringing you this water? Muhammad's response, water is pure and is not defiled by anything. Now, is any scientist on the planet going to say that nothing, that nothing defiles water, that nothing makes water impure? If that's the case, then why are we spending that much money in Africa to help basically villages yeah they could just water. get they could just get the, the 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 sayings of muhammad down there and realize that exactly. the water's not made in, exactly. impure by anything right yeah. so here again if you take muhammad's words seriously you're going to get sick and die this is not just hey may have been wrong we don't know you will die if you follow this this guy's yeah, teaching absolutely fortunately right. most muslims don't they know they understand better than their prophet did uh, so they know more than their prophet about science why do we even have to cook in boiled water? Well, you, you don't because it's not defiled by anything. So you can go yeah. get some water straight out of the sewer and uh, it's That's good right. to go. All right, so those are claims from the Hadith. And, and there, are, there are many, many more. Those should give you a, a, an idea of the various kinds of things Muhammad is saying, that this guy really is saying absurd things that will get you, will get you killed if you actually follow them. And these are the sorts of claims that we can actually investigate. Correct. And they turn out to be totally ridiculous. And this, is, But notice, it's Muslims who are making scientific accuracy the criterion for whether we should believe in him as a prophet. They're offering this. As you, as you pointed out, Muslim, many Muslims view this as their main argument. That's correct. And what do we That's find when we, when we look? Weird stuff. And if a Muslim will come back and tell me, oh, those hadith you picked are actually strange or weak, then why do we have him anyway? Yeah. So... Either way, you really cannot escape from this reality. Mm -hmm. And even if you think they're weak, somebody else will argue against your argument. Yep. And uh, so, the, but those are those are the hadiths. So suppose we're dealing with a Muslim who rejects all the hadiths together. The Quran only. Yeah, the Quran correct. only Muslim. So then we'd be stuck with, with the Quran only. And right. so there, there are plenty of passages we could go to in the Quran uh, here as well. Uh, we'll look at just a couple of, a couple of passages. Uh, one is the story of Dhul-Karnain. And what's amazing is Muslims today will say this doesn't refer to Alexander the Great, uh, who in the time of Muhammad was referred to as the, 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 man, of two, the man of two horns. Right? Right. Alexander the Great is the That's man right. of two horns. That's how he's portrayed on coins. That's how they refer to him. And not only that, if you, uh, read, if you read Surah 18, the passage about Dhul-Karnain, it matches up perfectly with the the what are called the Alexander romances, the these these books about Alexander. All the things he did in 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 here uh, are mentioned in other sources uh, of the time. So we know who this is referring to. Muslims have to deny that this is referring to Alexander because he's listed as a devout Muslim, and we know Alexander was as pagan and polytheistic as you could possibly be. Right? This guy was a devout, devout pagan polytheist. So right. the Quran portrays him as a, as a devout Muslim. We know that. Came, so That's this right. is another example of a historical inaccuracy, but we're going to focus on the scientific inaccuracy because uh, the Quran says in Surah 18, verses 84 to 86, Allah says, Lo, we made Alexander, so dual Karnain. If you, if you, if Muslims, if you don't want to believe that this is Alexander the Great, doesn't matter, um, anyone you want. Uh, Lo, so we made Dulkarnain strong in the land and gave him unto everything a road. And he followed a road till when he reached the setting place of the sun, he found it setting in a muddy spring and found a people thereabout. So, one, there is a setting place of the sun. There is actually a place on earth 
where the sun sets. Two, you can reach it. You can get there. That's if you right. go far enough west, you can reach the place of the setting of the sun, the place where the sun sets. And when you get there, you will find the sun setting in a muddy spring. The sun goes down into a muddy spring, and there are people who live there. So that's what the Quran says here. Now, how many of those statements are accurate according to modern science? One, that there's a setting place of the sun. Two, that you can get there. Three, that if you get there, um, you'll find the sun setting in a muddy spring. And four, that, that there are people who live there. How many of those statements would be correct according to modern scientists? I very much doubt that any of them will be correct. But even if we find one of them could be justified, probably the rest of them cannot. So uh, th this is obviously a problem. And so what do Muslims do here? They try to reinterpret the passage. And what they'll say is Dhul Karnain simply found some body of water, like a, a, a sea or something like this. He arrived at a sea or an ocean and he saw a sunset and it looked like the sun setting in this pool of water, but in actuality, he's just seeing a reflection. Now, you know Quranic Arabic. Absolutely. Is, what is this saying? Is this saying something about it just seeming to him be that, like an optical illusion? Not at all. Not at all. In fact, you look at the commentators and they give you multiple opinions and many of them assert and affirm that this is a muddy spring, muddy water, hot mud. I mean, all of them mm -hmm. talk about it. And here's another observation, by the way. We know that Alexander the Great, when he was expanding, he was going east, mm -hmm. not going west. So where exactly did he see something like this? Because going east does not at least allow him to reach a place like that. So I'm wondering now, where did Muhammad get this idea from other than a fable that was circulating around his time? Well, for, for us, there's no question that, that he got it from a fable, right? He, yeah. the, the, the stories are being told. It's an oral culture. They're passing stories around. So he's given stories of the, of the Alexander romance. Um, but uh, here, here's what's interesting. If, if we're not talking to a Quran-only Muslim, then we have a Sahih narration in Sunan Abu Daud. So this is one of the strong, this is classified as Sahih exactly. by Muslim, by Muslim Hadith scholars. Right. And he gives a little bit more information that doesn't, in, he's not talking about Dhul Karnain at all. Dhul Karnain's not in the story. It's Muhammad telling one of his followers where the sun goes when it sets. That's right. So That's Sunan problem. Abu Daud, number 3991. Abu Dar said, I was sitting behind the apostle of Allah who was riding a donkey while the sun was setting. He asked, do you know where this sets? So this is Muhammad asking one of his followers, hey, the sun's going, you know where the sun's going when it sets? This is a time for Muhammad to impart knowledge to one of his followers, right? This amazing scientific knowledge that only he knows because he's the prophet and it's been revealed to him. That's right. And you hear this, hey, do you know what? Oh my goodness, the prophet's speaking. I get to learn something about the universe that, that, that only Allah could reveal. That's right. Let me guess uh, the answer would have been uh, only Allah and the Prophet knows. Uh-huh, uh-huh. He yeah, asked, yeah, yeah. do you know where this sets? Yeah. I replied, Allah and his apostle know best. Right. So Allah and his apostle know best. He, Muhammad, said, it sets in a spring of warm water. Wow. Nothing about something appearing to Dhul Karnain in a certain way right. and uh, because That's he right. saw a reflection or anything. This is not... This is not about Dhul Karnain. This is Muhammad telling one of his followers where the sun goes. What does Muhammad say? It sets, what, it, the sun sets in a spring of warm water. That's right. So we can say that Muslims who try to reinterpret, who try to reinterpret Surah 18, that they're going against their own prophet. That, that, that's, that's a general rule in Islam is that Muhammad is the greatest interpreter of the Quran. If you claim you understand what the Quran means better than Muhammad, you've got a problem. Well, Muhammad clearly believed that the sun sets in a pool, exactly as Surah 18 says. So if you say you know better, you're once again saying you know better than Muhammad about science. And wait a minute, it, 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 isn't that the basis of the argument that Muhammad knew That's correct. new things that, that he couldn't have known? All right, so if you want to be a faithful Muslim, 
and you have the Quran, Allah saying one thing and Muhammad confirming the interpretation so that you're not allowed to uh, come up with a different interpretation, then if you want to be a faithful Muslim, you have to say Muhammad was a, a prophet and he said that the sun sets in a pool. So, you know, if I go out there and travel far enough, I will find the place where the sun sets and it will be setting in a pool. And you have to say that as a Muslim. All right, let's look at uh, uh, two more verses very quickly. Surah 67, verse 5. Allah says, And we have from of old adorned the lowest heaven with lamps. And we have made such lamps as missiles to drive away the evil one and have prepared for them the penalty of the blazing fire. A similar passage in Surah 37 uh, refers to these, these lamps as stars. So we Correct. know that they're referring to stars here. So we have adorned the lowest heaven with lamps. So with stars. So this is talking about the stars. And we have made such lamps, stars, as missiles to drive away the evil ones. So the evil jinn and so on. And have prepared for them the penalty of the blazing fire. Now, uh, we know that what this is referring to because Muhammad saw a shooting star with one of his followers and then started explaining what the shooting star is. So according to the Quran and Muhammad, when you see a shooting star, it's because a jinn or evil spirit is sneaking into paradise to try and hear Allah's secret plans so that he can then go spread around Allah's secret plans. That's right. And so in that situation, either Allah or one of the angels takes a star and hurls it at the demon. And so when you see a shooting star, it's because Allah took a star, one of the lamps, and hurled it at a demon. Notice, we have made the lamps, the stars, missiles to drive away the evil ones. Right. So when you see a shooting star, it's because Allah hurled a star at a demon. Now, there are multiple errors. One, shooting stars are not stars. They're, they're big rocks that have collided with our atmosphere. Um, but shooting stars are not actual stars. The author of the Quran believes that shooting stars are actual stars. Right. And so if the author of the Quran is Allah, then Allah, your God, Muslims, believes that shooting stars are actual stars that have collided with the Earth's atmosphere. If you, trust me, if, if an actual star collided with the Earth's atmosphere, it'd be a lot worse than seeing a shooting star. Uh, but, but the other thing is that, that when you see that, it's because a demon tried to sneak into paradise, right? Well, guess, that, guess what that means? That means paradise is right outside our atmosphere, right? Exactly. It's right there. Allah's throne is paradise. Allah making his plans with there the angels. It's the right outside. heaven's idea. Yeah, it's right there, right? I mean, he had, to, he had to get them right there. So multiple, multiple problems here. And again, this is the argument that's supposed to show us that Islam is true. Uh, which scientists... Which scientists in the world are going to say, oh my goodness, you mean Muhammad? Muhammad, 14 centuries ago, knew that shooting stars are stars that God hurled at, at demons to try to keep them from sneaking into paradise and listening to his plan? Oh my goodness, it, it, it's, Islam must be the truth because we have miraculous scientific confirmation. How many scientists are going to say that? Uh, I've never met one. All right, one more because we looked at uh, right. Muhammad's view of... Uh, astronomy. And just uh, let me just uh, uh, give people uh, a quick summary of what we have uh, discussed so far. There are problems just by reading mm -hmm. the evidence presented to us. If you can just ask your Muslim friend just to read it for themselves, right there you can discover problems if they're willing to reason. Yeah, I mean, notice we're not, we're, I mean, we're, we're, these are obviously false claims. We can understand what these are saying and what they're saying right. is obviously false. Correct. And so if Islam stands or falls with its scientific confirmation, then Islam falls because the, these, are, these are obviously false claims. Uh, so we'll look at one more uh, in the realm of biology. So Allah wants to impart more knowledge and explain to us what uh, human beings are formed from. Uh, one of the many things that the Quran says that we are formed from. But uh, in Surah 86, verses 6 to 7, Allah says, Man is created from a drop emitted, pro proceedings from between the backbone and the ribs. So the drop that we come from. The, the Muslim sources talk about the, the semen drop that we're created from, and then it unites with the female semen. Right. Um, that's, that's according to the Hadith. The female have semen too, and the two mix together, and whichever one rises to the top, 
that's the one that decides whether uh, whether the child will be male or female and so on. Uh, total nonsense according to biology. But right here, just, just this Quran verse, the drop that's emitted. Uh, now, the, what he gets right here is that the, the drop of semen that's emitted uh, does have something to do with, uh, you know, babies being born. He gets that right. But again, that's something that anyone would have been able to tell you back then. But he goes on to tell us where it forms. So he's, he's imparting to us some scientific knowledge that we can test. Where does the semen form? Right, right in this area between the backbone and and the ribs. Yeah, it's very specific, basically. Is this area between the backbone and ribs where semen is formed according to modern scientists? Nope, 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 nope. So, and by the way, again, there, there are many more examples like this, but when you go through the Muslim sources, if you, if you, if you put them all together in the Hadith and the commentaries and, um, and what we find in the Quran, you basically get a picture like this. You have a giant fish or whale at the bottom of everything. And then you have seven earths stacked on top of each other like pancakes. They're, f they're all flat. They're stacked up like pancakes, except that there's a 500 year journey in between each one of them. Right. Uh, that's according to Muhammad. Um, so you have seven flat earths stacked on top of each other. And above that, you have, uh, you have the, the heaven, which is actually a solid object that will fall on us if Allah doesn't hold us up. And, uh, of course, inside there you have the stars, which are missiles that Allah uses to shoot the demons. And, of course, you have uh, the sun setting, you know, in a muddy pool and so on. And that you have, of course, seven of these solid heavens, solid domes above the earth. And you go all the way up to the top, and then there are these um, eight giant uh, mountain goats and so on that, that are, are below the throne. So that's what you get if you look at the Muslim sources on astronomy. If you look at uh, the Muslim sources on uh, uh, embryonic development, so the development of a baby, you get semen uh, comes be between the backbone and ribs forms, and it joins with the female semen. And again, whichever rises to the top, that determines the sex of the child. But the, the semen then becomes a blood clot and then becomes uh, like a chewed piece of flesh or something like this, right. and then uh, becomes bones, and then those bones are covered with flesh and so on. And only then does Allah decide whether it's male or female. And almost everything there that goes beyond what people of the time would have known, because again, people understood, hey, you know, they have sex and are produced. They understood from miscarriages that there are some different stages to development and so on. But everything Muhammad said that goes beyond what ordinary people would have known, he gets wrong. And then, of course, you have the area of hygiene that, you know, it, 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 it's, it's good to dunk flies in your food or you can take water that's, you know, been anywhere and it's, it's, it's still good. You can use it for your ablutions. You can drink it. Uh, you can do anything. And notice, if you actually take that seriously, if you start using that kind of water, you're going to get sick. Even if you just rub it on your hands, you're going to get sick. And what's Muhammad's solution if you get sick? Camel urine, just drink enough camel urine and, and you'll, you'll feel better. How can anyone, I don't say, how can anyone look at all of this and say, you know how we know that Islam is true? By all of this amazingly correct scientific information. It's amazing, especially today, in our modern days, with modern discoveries, modern science, with uh, everything we know about healthcare, everything we know about astronomy, everything we know from satellite imagery, I mean, it just baffles me that you still find some Muslims passionate about defending all of these things, and especially when they start telling you that these are just metaphorical. Mm -hmm. Since when? Because you read the commentators who were so close to the time of Muhammad, never that they assume these mm -hmm. to be metaphorical in one sense or another. Mm -hmm. And, it, it, and it, if, if that's the claim, and Muslims have to claim something like that because it, there's no way around th these passages. Um, then what they're really saying is like this, something like this. Uh, we know that Islam is true because of its amazing scientific accuracy, but whenever Muhammad makes a clear scientific statement, whether it's in the Quran or in the Hadith, it's invariably wrong. So reinterpret those. And once you've reinterpreted them, then 
you can bring them into line with modern science and then, oh, it's a miracle. Well, the, the miracle there is, is not the, the statements of Muhammad. The miracle there is, is what you might call the miracle of reinterpretation. That's where, right. Yeah. And I can tell you this, brother. Uh, I am so amazed that Muslims always come to the rescue of their God. And sometimes they act like they know even better than their God and their prophet. Well, they do, right? You, you can take any Muslim off the street and he will know more That's than right. Allah and Muhammad did about the universe, about hygiene, about human reproduction and so and, on. And that's what I tell him. I say sometimes you should be God or Muhammad and people should follow you mm -hmm. since you obviously know much better than your own God and his messenger. They must be prophets, in which case, once again, Islam is false. Well, brother, thank you so much. Uh, it's been an excellent series. And of course, we want to continue this, uh, Lord willing. And once again, we invite our uh, uh, viewers uh, to go to our websites, hirointernational.com, to watch this particular series. And of course, any previous videos and future videos as well. And uh, when it comes to our dear brother here, you can go to his YouTube channel, Act 17 Apologetics. And of course, watch out for our announcement that we will be doing in our uh, basically uh, Facebook pages. And uh, certainly, we'll keep you posted on any future plans. Until we meet again, have a blessed day. Mm -hmm.